Wonder of the Wasteland by Zane Gray, Chapter 27, Part 1. That afternoon when Adam returned to camp, sore in body and spent in force, yet with strangely tranquil soul, there was an old Indian waiting for him. Jeannie had gone back long before Adam, and she sat on the sand, evidently having difficult but enjoyable conversation with the visitor. At the sight of his hard, craggy bronze face, serried and seamed with the lines of years, it seemed that a bolt shot back in Adam's heart, opening a long, closed door. Charlie Jim, he ejaculated in startled gladness. How, Eagle? His deep voice, the familiar yet forgotten name, the lean brown hand confirmed Adam's sight. Chief, the white man has not forgotten his Indian friend, replied Adam. Eagle no same, boy, like mescal stalk. Heat big, many moon, snows on the mountain, said Charlie Jim with a gleam of a smile breaking the bronze face. His fingers touched the white hair over Adam's temples. Pathos and dignity marked the action. Boy no more. Charlie Jim returned. Eagle has his white feathers now. Jeannie burst into a trill of laughter. You funny old, you funny old people. You make me old, feel old too, she protested as she ran away. Charlie Jim's somber eyes followed her, then returned to question Adam. She same girl here, long time sick, man's girl and he made a sign to show the height of a child and the weakness of a man's lungs. Yes, chief, he her father, dead, mother dead too, replied Adam, and he pointed to the two green graves across the stream. Uh, no live good, no get well. Eagle sick man have brother, him dead, Jim find him, him dig gold, no water, Dead, Jim find him heap bones. It was this Adam's it was thus Adam heard the story of the tragedy of Jeannie's uncle. Charlie Jim told it more clearly, though just as briefly, in his own tongue. Moons before he had found a prospector's pack, and then a pile of rags and bones, half buried in the sand, over in a valley beyond the Cottonwood Mountains. He recognized the man's pack as belonging to the brother of the sick man, Linwood, both of whom he knew. Adam could trust an Indian's memory. Jeannie's uncle had come to the not rare end of a wandering prospector's life, the old desert tragedy, thirst. All at once, Adam's eyes seemed to burn blind with a red, dim veil, and his tongue clove to the roof of his mouth and threw his body past a cold shudder, and he had strange vision of himself staggering blindly in a circle, plunging madly for the false mirage. The haunting plague passed away, and Adam turned to examine the few pack articles Charlie Jim had brought for possible identification of the dead. One of these, a silver belt buckle of odd design, oxidized and tarnished, might possibly be remembered by Jeannie. Adam called her, placed it in her hands. Jeannie, did you ever see that? he asked. Yes, she replied with a start of recognition. It was my father's. He gave it to my uncle. Adam nodded to the Indian. Chief, you were right. Oh, Wani, it means he's found my uncle dead, exclaimed Jeannie in awe. Yes, Jeannie, replied Adam with a hand of sympathy upon her shoulder. We know now he'll never come back. With the buckle in her hands, the girl slowly walked toward the graves of her parents. Charlie Jim mounted his pony to ride away. Chief, tell me of Oia, said Adam. The Indian gazed down upon Adam with somber eyes. Then his lean, sinewy hand swept up with stately and eloquent gesture to be pressed over his heart. Oh, ye are dead. 
he replied sonorously, and then he looked beyond Adam out across the lonesome land. Beyond the ranges, perhaps, to the realm of his red gods. Adam read the Indian gesture. Oia had died of a broken heart. He stood there at the edge of the oasis, stricken mute, as his old Indian friend turned to go back across the valley to the Cohia encampment. A broken heart, that superb Indian maiden, so lithe and tall and strong, so tranquil, so sure, serene of soul as the steady light of her midnight eyes, dead of a broken heart. She loved him, a man alien to her race, a wanderer and a stranger within her gates, and when he had gone away, life became unendurable. Another mystery of the lonely, gray, melancholy wastelands. Adam quivered there in the grip of it all. Later, when he returned to Jeannie, it was to say simply, My dear, as soon as I can find my burrows, we pack for the long trail. No, she exclaimed with lighting eyes. Yes, I shall take you out to find your home. Honest engine, she blazed at him, springing erect. Jeannie, I would not tease about that. We know your uncle's dead. The time to go has come and we'll start at sunrise. Forgotten were Jeannie's dreams of yesterday. A day at her time of life meant change, growth, oblivion for what had been. With a cry of wondering delight, she flung herself upon Adam, leaped and climbed to the great height of his face and there like a bird. She pecked at him with cool, sweet lips and clung to him in an ecstasy. Don't, child, he said huskily as he disengaged himself from her wild embrace. It amazed him and hurt him to see her radiance at the thought of leaving the desert oasis which had been home for so long. Fickleness of youth. Yesterday she'd wanted to live there forever and today the enchantments of new life people, places, called to her alluringly. It was what Adam had expected. It was what he wanted for her. How clear had been his vision of the future. How truly the moment he had fought down his selfish desires had he read her innocent heart. His own swelled with gladness, numbing out the pang. For him, some little need of praise... Not little was it to have conquered self. Not little was it to have builded the happiness of an orphan. Adam's burrows had grown gray in their years of idle, contented life at the oasis. Like the roadrunners, they enjoyed the proximity of camp, and he found them shaggy and fat, half asleep while they gazed, grazed. He drove them back to the shade of the cottonwoods, where Jeannie, seeing this last and immutable proof of forthcoming departure, began to dance over the sand in wild glee. Jeannie, you'll do well to save some of your nimbleness, admonished Adam. We'll have a load. You've got to climb the mountain and walk till I can buy another burrow. Oh, Wunny, I'll fly, she cried. Huh. I'd rather think you will fly the very first time a young fellow sees you. A big girl in those ragged boy clothes. Then Adam thrilled anew with the sweetness, the wonder of her. His cold heart warmed to the core. How he would live in the hope and happiness and love that surely must be awaiting this girl. His mention of a young fellow suddenly rendered Jeannie amazed, shy, and bewildered. But, but, Wani, you, you won't let any young fellow see me this way, she pleaded. How can I help it? You just wouldn't sew and make dresses. Now you're in for it. We'll meet a lot of lads, and Jeannie, just the other day, you didn't care how I saw you. Oh, but you're different. You're my dad, my brother, old Tackwitch, and everything. Thank you. That makes me feel a little better. 
Suddenly, she turned her dark eyes upon him, piercing now and dilating with thought. Wani, are you sorry to leave? Yes, he replied sadly. Then I'll stay if you want me ever, always, she said very low. The golden flush paled her on cheek. She was a child, yet on the verge of womanhood. Jeannie, I'm sorry, but I'm glad, too. What I want most is to see you settled in a happy home with a guardian. Young friends about you, all you want. She appeared sober now, and Adam gathered that she had thought more seriously than he'd given her credit for. Wani, you're good, and your goodness makes you see all that for me. But a guardian, a happy home, all I want. I'll be poor. I'll have to work for a living. I won't have you. Then suddenly she seemed about to weep. Her beautiful eyes dimmed, but Adam startled her out of her weakness. Poor? Well, Jeannie Linwood, you've got a surprise in store for you. Wherewith he led her to the door of the hut, and tearing up the old wagon boards that had served as a floor, he dug in the sand underneath and dragged forth bag after bag, which he dropped at her feet with sodden, heavy thumps. Gold, Jeannie, gold. It's yours. You'll be rich. And all this was dug by your father. I don't know how much, but it's a fortune. Now what do you say? The rapture Adam had anticipated did not manifest itself. Jeannie seemed glad, certainly, but the significance of the gold didn't really strike her. And you never told me. Well, by the great horn spoon, I'm rich. Wani, will you be my guardian? I will till I can find you, Wani replied stoutly. Oh, never look for one, then I will have all I want. The last sunlight, the last starlight, the last sunrise for Adam and Jeannie at the oasis were beautiful memories of the past. Adam, driving the burrows along the dim old Indian trail, meditated on the inevitableness of the end of all things. For nearly three years he had seen that trail every few days, and always he had speculated on the distant time when he would climb it with Jeannie. That hour had struck. Jeannie, with the light feet of an Indian, was behind him, now chattering like a magpie and then significantly silent. She had her bright face turned to the enchanting adventures of the calling future. She was turning her back upon the only home she could remember. Look, Jeannie, how gray and dry the canyon is, said Adam, hoping to divert her. Just a little water in that whitewash, and you know, it never reaches the valley. It sinks in the sand. Now look way above you, high over the foothills. And you see those gleams of white? Those streaks of black, snow genie, and the pines and spruces. They camped at the edge of the spruces and pines. How sweet and cool and damp the air to the desert dweller. The wind sang through the trees with different tone, and Adam, unpacking the burrows, turned them loose, sure of their delight in the rich green grass. Jeannie, tired out with the long climb, fell upon one of the open packs to rest. With his rifle, Adam strode away among the scattered pines and clumps of spruce. The smell of this forest almost choked him, and yet it seemed he could not smell and breathe enough. The dark green spear-pointed spruces and the brown bark pines so lofty and spreading intoxicated his desert eyes. He looked and reveled, forgetting the gun in his hands until his aimless steps frightened deer from right before him. Then to shoot was a habit, the result of which was regret. These deer were tame, not like the weary telescope-eyed mountain sheep. And Adam, after his first exultant thrill, the old recurrent thrill from out the past gazed down with sorrow at the sleek, beautiful deer he had slain. What dual character he had, what contrast of thrill and pain, 
of blood and brain, of desert and civilization, of physical and spiritual, of nature and, but he did not know what. He laughed later, and Jeannie laughed too, at how ravenous he was at supper, how delicious the venison tasted, and how good it was to eat. Guess I'll give myself up as a bad job, he told her. Wani, well, for me, you'll always be Tekwich, giant of the desert and god of the clouds. Ah, you'll forget me in ten days after you meet him, replied Adam somewhat bitterly. Jeannie could only stare her amaze. Forgive me, child, I don't mean that. I know you'll never forget me, but you've been my, my little girl so long that it hurts to think of you being some other man's. Then he was to see the marvel of Jeannie's first blush. <sighs> it was well that Adam had thought to pack extra blankets for Jeannie. She'd never felt the nip of frost, and when night settled down black with the wind rising, she needed to be warmly wrapped. Adam liked the keen air and also the feel of the campfire heat on his outstretched palms. Next morning... The sky was overcast with broken, scudding clouds, and a shrill wind tossed the tips of the pines. Jeannie crawled out of her blankets to her first experience of winter. When she dipped her hands into the water, she squealed and jerked them out. Then at Adam's bantering laughter, she bravely dashed into the ordeal of bathing face and hands with that icy water. Adam did not have any particular objective point in mind, he felt strangely content to let circumstances of travel or chance or his old wandering instinct guide him. They traveled leisurely through the foothills on the western side of the Sierra Madres, finding easy trails and good campsites and meeting Indians, by the way. Six days out from the desert, they reached a wagon road, and that led down to a beautiful country of soft, velvety green hills and narrow, pleasant valleys where clumps of live oaks grew. And here and there nestled a ranch. So they traveled on. The country grew less rugged, and some of it appeared to belong to great ranches, once the homes of Spanish grandees. Late one afternoon, travel brought them within sight of Santa Isabel, Adam turned off the main road in search of a place to camp, and passing between two beautiful hills, he came upon a little valley, all green with live oaks and brown with tilled ground. He saw horses, cattle, and finally a farmhouse, low and picturesque, of the vine-covered adobe style particular to a country first inhabited by the Spanish. End of chapter 27, part 1.